G'day and welcome to another episode of Perth Property Insider. I'm your host, Jared Mann, and today, really excited to have Lacey Filipich from Money School back along to cover and help us bounce around ideas for raising financially savvy kids. So I've had this one top of mind and I'm sure it's going to be relevant to lots of our listeners. Very excited. We've had to break it up into a two-parter. So stick around for the next one. Uh, In this first part, we'll be looking at some of the key concepts uh, to introduce to kids and at what ages, when is it too young to get started entirely, how to make things interesting and fun and not boring so that they tune out. We also look at, for those of us that have grown up without money, how do we not spoil our kids? Big one. That was my number one question I wanted to get some Lacey's take on and what are the, some of the way um, some of the ways we see teenagers go wrong with their finances. So let's go inside. Welcome to Perth Property Insider, where you will learn how to grow your wealth and improve your life using Perth Property. Our show is brought to you by Investors Edge Real Estate, the highly rated and award-winning property management specialist servicing the whole of Perth. Now here is your host, Jared Mann. Welcome back to the podcast, Lacey. So thrilled to have you on again. Uh, your last episodes were so popular and any of our listeners should go back and check them out um, if they haven't already. But today, we've got a wonderful topic on raising financially savvy kids and how this one came about was um, I've got a three-year-old. I know many of our clients have got kids as well and we're all trying to do things better for the next generation, but it's such a you know, balancing act, isn't it? And I'm excited to get stuck into it today with you. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thanks for having me, Jared. Delighted to be back. So let's dive in, shall we? Um, what age can we even start teaching our kids about money? Because um, when is too soon, too early, and, <laughs> and when is it too late? <laughs> yeah, good point. So I don't think it's ever too late, first of all. So I think I would say pretty much anyone's success story that's happened late in life will show you that it's never too late. So take heart if you've got teenage kids who are driving you crazy by spending all their money, (laughs) they might (laughs) surprise you. As far as how young you can start, I found this surprising myself as a parent. I had sort of thought you needed to wait till they were talking about it at school, you know. So they start doing, even in kindy and pre-primary now in Australia, in the curriculum is things like recognising currency. So if you've got kids in pre-primary, you might have had an email home from the teacher saying, hey, make sure you use some change, and you suddenly went, oh, what's that? Because I haven't touched any coins in a very mm-hmm. long time. But what I found quite interesting is you can actually start talking to them about money much earlier than that. I actually started with my kids before they were three. And that might sound really young, but it's because you don't actually need to focus on the maths or the concept of money and exchange itself. I found focusing on the idea of waste much more useful with young kids. So just like we tell them to turn off the tap when they're brushing their teeth because we don't waste water or turn off the light when you leave the room because we don't want to waste electricity, money is a resource to be used wisely. And they get that from really young. So I had this conversation with my two and three quarter year old daughter in the shops Mm. once who wanted to buy a stool that was three times the price of the other stool. We had a discussion about how we can buy the expensive stool or buy the cheaper stool, which is pretty much identical, um, and also get milk and bread for the week. So it's wasteful to buy the expensive one that's going to do the same thing. And she got it. And a lot of kids, when you talk about it in terms of waste and relate it back to something they're aware of, and I found bread and milk was really good with my kids because they're massive white carbohydrate and dairy people. (laughs) (laughs) They value those things. Might be something else with your family. But if you're focused on being um, sustainable and you talk about waste already, it's just the same concept. So, yeah, as young as before three if you want to. Yeah, wonderful. And with our, I've I've got a three-year-old, as I think I might have mentioned, and I've she's got her own little money box and she does, you know, things to get chores and she's amazing how much she's amassed in her. I don't know where she gets it all from because it's not all from me. Um, <laughs> but at least she's getting ahead of her. She plays shopkeeper and we play little games where she buys things and, you know. So I've sort of started to introduce her to money that way, right or, or wrong, and and get the, co- the concept of it. So, you know, introducing yeah. waste would be a great idea, I think. Yeah, and look, I don't think there's a right or wrong there either. I think it's the same with every parent and child. They're all different. We're all different. The kids Mm. are all different. You've got to find what works for your child. So you might have two children, and this is the case in my family, Uh, you know, my sister and I, 
uh, two children raised in the same environment with very different attitudes and interests around money. So you've kind of got to tailor it. I don't think there's any wrong though. So don't worry. It's okay. not right or wrong. If you've, if you've done something <laughs> you think, oh, that didn't work quite well. Hey, it's, you know, trial and error. You've got to try and find out what your kids are interested in. But if she loves it, then great. The head start. And what are some of the other concepts that you might start looking to introduce as they get older then? Yeah. So this is, this is really interesting because it's heavily embedded in our curriculum already. So people that say, oh, you don't get taught this in school. Actually, it's been in the curriculum for over a decade. It's just that we get very inconsistent delivery. And that's a lot because, um, you know, you might have had this experience at school. Something in theory is very different to something in practice. And if you have a teacher who doesn't do a great job of connecting the theory and the practice, it doesn't really really click in your mind. So Mm. you might have learned about compounding, but you didn't realise that that was associated with debt if your teacher didn't draw that link for you or your parent didn't. So... So that's the first thing is to know is that, yes, our kids are getting taught this stuff. It's through the financial mathematics stream. It's through the humanities and social sciences stream under the business and economic section. There's lots of it at school. But there's nothing better than having the same thing reinforced at home, right? So Mm, if your kids are getting a great education about money at school, that's wonderful. But there's no point learning about healthy eating at school and then coming home and having fish and chips for dinner every night, is there? You know, you're not going to get to apply those skills. So whether or not they're doing a great job at your child's school, you being proactive is going to help. And I think I would say to most people in primary school, so we're talking about up to 12 years old in Australia, I would be focused on money management skills. So how do I earn money? Because you would have heard probably from um, younger kids, and I'm sure Mm. most people can relate to this, they think that money comes out of a hole in the wall. They think (laughs) you go to the ATM and you get it. They don't necessarily connect that, oh, that's why mummy and daddy go to work, (laughs) you know, that kind of thing. They don't necessarily connect that their parent Working outside the home is how that money comes in and then how the money gets distributed. So the more you can do in primary school to get them understanding earning and then out of that earning, how you save and how you spend, that split. So we need to keep some money for future us to pay for all these things and get us through hiccups and and if we want to buy big stuff in the future and for our investing and then we have the spending that we can't avoid and understanding the value of money that way. And I find if they can understand the value of time exchange for money, as that when they're young, because most people are going to have to go through that process of exchanging their time for money at some mm. point, but un- unless they become business owners uh, or do something that's product based or become financially independent. Well, it can help you work out whether you re- how much of the exchange you want to go down with becoming a. <laughs> <laughs> you might yes. work out you don't like work. <laughs> yes, really and young. I have to say <laughs> that happens a bit. I've seen quite a few kidpreneurs who launch their businesses, make this money, and then I get them to calculate their hourly rate on the profit and then they're like, oh, I made 50 cents an hour and suddenly that money is valuable to them. So I think that's probably when the kids are young, understanding the value of money and money management is really important. As they get older and into high school, they they need to understand debt before they get to 18, before they can sign up for anything. That's really important that they understand that debt is borrowing from future you Future you will pay back the amount you borrowed plus interest. That can be huge amounts of money and understand how there can be good debt used as well for things like assets. But the bad debt's the thing you really want to help them be prepared to avoid. And, of course, we hope to get them excited about investing at that age. So all the stuff that's about wealth building. So I think um, there are plenty of kids in primary school who get excited about shares and want to learn about debt. So if your kids are into it younger, go for it. Um, the curriculum certainly has a lot of it through all the way through to year 12. Don't let your kids drop out of maths, please. Keep them in maths. It's a fascinating mm-hmm. thing in Western Australia that um, we don't have to do maths in year 11 and 12. So one in four young women is not studying maths at the end of high school. And that's where they're going to get some of that really important stuff around debt and compounding. And I really hope everyone sticks with it. But yeah, by the end of high school, I'd be hoping that they would at least understand there's managing my money and then there's growing my wealth. And I guess all of this can be easier said than done sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, yes. How do we as parents, you know, make it interesting and fun? Because probably part of the reason they might have those lessons in school and check out uh, and not learn anything is because of the way that they're delivered. And I know different teachers have different ways of making these things fun and interesting. And when you get that really good teacher, you know, it just changes the whole experience and what you take away. But, mm. you know, how can we make it more fun and interesting at home? Yeah. So well, you've already <laughs> talked a little bit about this with your daughter, right? She's already shown an interest in accumulating money. She's had an interest in paying shops customised to your child. 
So it's it's a fascinating thing that two children in the same household might have completely different interests. They might have completely mm-hmm. different attitudes. That shocked me. I didn't realise it with my second child. I mean, I don't know why I didn't think that was going to happen, but, you know, they come out and you're <laughs> like, wow, it's a whole different piece in a good yeah. way. <laughs> So tailor to your child, recognise what they like. There's no recipe here. There's no like you must do these lessons in this order. You must teach them this way. Money is something you touch every day. So whether you're doing it through a card or whether you're doing it through online transactions or literally money in your wallet. So there's no right or wrong. So I'd say, you know, think about how your kid likes to learn. The other thing I think that's important for parents to realise is sitting down and giving them a lecture rarely works on anything. I don't know about you. It hasn't worked for me for anything. My kids switch off after a couple of minutes, and I'm pretty sure that it gets worse when they become teenagers. Planting little seeds is enough. You know, one little comment is often enough. And when you see that piques interest, so my mum did this to me. She asked me what I was going to do with the money that I was going to earn out of my first business when I was 10. And then uh, I was like, oh, well, I might spend it on. I can't even remember what I was going to spend it on. Um, And she was like, well, did you know that uh, money put in the bank earns more money? The bank gives you more money. And that was enough for me. I was like, what? What is this thing? And she explained compound interest to me. It's a chat we had side by side in the car, driving 10 minutes down the road. It wasn't a lecture, but it was enough for me to go, oh, wow. Whereas if she said, hey, Lucy, come sit down. Today we're going to teach you about compounding. That would not have gone <laughs> yeah. well, right? So, <laughs> exactly. So these taking these little opportunities, the hundred small things, doing that kind of stuff is really important. Um, letting them experiment and fail is also really important. It's mm. tempting for all of us, I think, as parents, and we've seen the, the description of helicopter parents who float over top and lawnmower parents who smooth every bump in the road before mm-hmm. their child gets to them. Those things do not help your child in the long term. They make our lives quicker and easier, but we know that they, the kids have to struggle. They have to overcome obstacles. Mm. They have to build their confidence. So don't be afraid to let them fail if the stakes are reasonably low. I guess Most if of they've the time, saved up for that toy and they then go and buy it and then they come to the realisation that they haven't got any money left, that's probably a really great lesson. <laughs> exactly, and the toy's broken and I don't play with it. And yeah. you go, see, was that, was, that a, was that a good choice with your money or do you think that was a bit wasteful? And they might mm. come to their own conclusion of, oh, yeah, it's a bit wasteful. Even, you know, I want to buy this particular share or, um, you know, I want to go and spend every cent I've got in the bank account. Do you know those kinds of things? When yeah. they're young, if they completely yeah. stuff What's it up. What's the consequences, you know? Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. They're not going to. As so long as it's nothing that's life As long as they're not taking out a you know a fifty k loan for a car that they can't afford at age seventeen, uh, whatever. Mm, <laughs> so exactly, that's where it can you get know, a bit more yeah. Serious. Well, that's exactly right. We'll talk a little bit later. I think about those those you know situations you want to help ones. them avoid. <laughs> but most of the time, you want them to fail. And I guess the one final thing I'll add. If I could only have a child for one small experience, you know, like if you only had one opportunity to teach a child about money, I would get them between 10 and 12 years old and I would make them start their own business because they learn the value of their money. They learn how important it is to manage their money. They understand profit and loss, which is exactly the same as money coming in from an income and then Mm. you're spending. Um, And it just has been the most effective way to teach young kids. And I think there's a magic age between 10 and 12 where they seem to still be really open to that. So that's, not necessarily backed up by science or anything. That's just my opinion. Mm. Um, but that's if I've got to do one thing, that's the thing I'd do to teach them about money. I'm sure it would probably help them with confidence and learning sales and marketing or any other, you know, variety of skills that can really help them too. So Exactly. And it's Good fun. One. They love it. They just, I've never seen, it's, it seems to be contagious. You know, one child starts a business and then the other children go, oh, I want to do that too. And then <laughs> before you know it, you've got dozens of them and they really enjoy it. They don't have to do it for long. They don't have to keep it going for years. It might be a one-off experience that they do for a couple of months, but it, it's exciting. So mm. as much as it's annoying to have your child on the verge doing the lemonade stand and watch them and all that stuff, <laughs> if that's how they learn, it's a really tangible way to do yeah. it and it's fun. I remember um, I did weeding and babysitting and a whole range of things and then when I worked out how hard they were, I got my brothers and sisters to help and I kind of semi-contracted out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're going over here and doing the weeding <laughs> at this place and got you that's this awesome. job. And, yeah, yeah. So. well, that's the way to do it, right? And through that, look at you now. You're running a business. It's the same principle, right? Yes. You know, just on a much bigger scale. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was fun, and I loved it at the time. And I think if um, you know, once you associate, once you get that money to and associate the exchange, and then you have a bit of a goal in mind of what you might use it for, you know, it kind of gets you ex- excited as a kid about what you can do for yourself, even at a young age. 
Exactly. And when we think about where our kids are going to end up in the future, things like the gig economy, people working for multiple employers, they're more likely to find themselves in that kind of experience of being their own little mini business, Mm. even if it is as a sole trader. So you're giving them skills that are going to really help them in the future. So for those of us that grew up without money, and that was certainly uh, the situation in our household, I guess we want our kids to have that better life and how do we do it without spoiling them? Because that's probably my number one (laughs) question that I keep asking myself. (laughs) Oh, and um, isn't it tempting? It is. Yeah, I I totally get that concern and it's natural. And when you think about even the generation above us, so the baby boomers, and then Mm. they had the veterans, there was some of that there. You know, these people who lived through wartime who didn't want their kids to you know, be eating, yeah. dripping and, and bread for dinner, you, you know, that kind TV, of but, You know, this yeah. new whiz bang thing, we never had this as a, exactly. as a kid. And that's natural. Been. Yeah, it's natural for us to want a higher quality of life for our children. I think um, the problem with that is you get this short-term gratification and potentially a long-term hindrance because they get used to getting everything they want. Now, in our household, it's Lego and Pokemon cards, okay? We're at that age. I've got a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. Everybody wants Lego all the time and Pokemon cards all the time. And, like, we can absolutely afford to go out and buy them any time we want. It's not a problem at all. But if we get them all the time, they, they suddenly get this instant gratification. They don't learn any delay. And so we, we have to very deliberately give them that opportunity to practice that. If we don't, you're setting them up to be little kind of the equivalent of drug addicts in relation to spending. And mm. the long-term pain with that is much worse than the, lo- the short-term pain of them being unhappy with me, <laughs> you know. So I, I, and I guess this is that whole, um, if you make the easy decision, you get a hard life. If you make the harder decision, you get an easier life. Pretty much every mistake I've made in parenting is because I've taken a shortcut or been a bit lazy um, and, and later on gone, I shouldn't have done that. So this is one area where I think you've got to be very strategic And you've got to think about what's actually going to help them develop that instant gratification and try to resist just giving them everything because you can. Because if they don't learn the value of those things, they'll never be able to hold on to them later. They'll never be able to resist that urge later. It's it's like a muscle. You have to build that. Mm. So I think you've got to to think about that long-term payoff there. And especially please don't be saving up massive house deposits for your kids and telling them that you're doing it for them. By all means, help them. By all means, you know, yeah, it's such a hard something. line of how you how you do it. And yeah, but don't don't give them this whole it's going to be easy for you and we're going to make it easy for you. You know, they have to understand that everything doesn't get handed to them on a platter. And I guess I'm of the philosophy where, you know, I don't think we owe our children anything. There's no obligation on you to give over huge amounts of cash so they can buy a home. Um, lovely if you can, but don't set that expectation up when they're young. Make it a nice surprise mm. later if you want to do it. But don't swoop in like you're going to save them. They've got to do that themselves. And I think continuing to focus on waste is the way to do that. What's a what's a good use of our money that would be wasteful of money? You know, like that understanding how the brain chemistry works around wanting to spend, talking to them about it. You know, I know you want to buy this thing. That's because your brain's sending these messages to you because it's burning a hole in your pocket. You know, that that's going to be wasteful, isn't it? We've got to not listen to that first response. We've got to be better about thinking about it. It's the same as you would talk to them about sugar or, you know, sitting in front of the TV all day, as my children would love to do. Um, those sort You're of probably understanding. probably seeing the coming. ads on TV that's making us want to spend. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And welcome to capitalism. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I think that whole um, just making sure that you don't overdo it. You can be kind. You can be generous. But don't give them everything all the time. You're setting yourself up for misery there. So what are some of the ways you see teenagers and probably young adults and maybe even older adults go wrong with their finances? Because that's usually a good good place to start it on the negative side. Oh, yes, yes. And, look, I do find there's one big risk area. It's in debt. Debt is where people come unstuck. I think you can be living payday to payday for a long time and not get into trouble. It's not ideal but you can cover your costs and you'll be okay and hopefully at some point you'll have enough income to save. But the people who end up going into debt are the ones who find themselves in downward spirals really quickly and often, and this is really concerning, I remember seeing a survey a couple of years ago and they were looking at um, 21 to 25-year-olds and they were taking forward on average $2,500 worth of credit card debt forward each month, this group that they interviewed. And when they asked them how much they owed, their answer was the minimum repayment, not the balance. They were like, oh, I owe $200. Like, no, that's what you have to pay each month. 
Uh, and then, oh, no, I owe 2500 dollars So this lack of understanding that when you borrow the money, you're going to be charged interest, you're going to pay more, and you don't stop till you're done. Mm. And that things like credit cards have high fees and even buy now, pay later. I laugh every time someone says to me, but there's no fees with buy now, pay later. It's better than a credit card. Look, most credit cards have a 55-day interest-free period. Most buy now, pay later is 56 days. It's one day difference that you're going to get this interest-free effect. And then if you don't pay it back on time, you're going to hit with fees. You're also going to have account fees. So although they call them fees, which allows them to get around the national debt code, it's still paying more. <laughs> so mm. all of these, these debt options are becoming more and more accessible. And that's what worries me, I think, with young people. It's so easy to get an app on your phone that lets you take your pay earlier uh, and then you pay 5% of that back to the people who lent it to you or do that buy now, pay later, and it's, and it's encouraged. And we know it's to get you to spend more. So I think that's where a lot of young people come unstuck. The other thing that I find fascinating, and I've seen one good TED talk on it, uh, I'll have to try and find the link for you, was about how people talk about, oh, you're young, don't worry about it, you know, go and spend now, have a great time. And especially people in their 20s, they're like, oh, I'm only in my 20s, I don't need to do anything. Your 20s will be the making of your financial future mm-hmm. if you do it right. It is it's, I'm not saying you have to have the perfect career. I'm not saying you have to be slogging your guts out 24-7. But don't treat it as a cop-out decade. Otherwise, you hit 30 and you haven't started and all those people who started at 18 yeah. are well ahead of you. And everybody I saw in my life that that went and got, got went towards careers, all sorts of careers, people who went straight out of school, people who went to uni or TAFE and, and focused on trying to build a career, trying to build experience, and some of them moved to different careers later, that kind of thing. Didn't matter, but they focused on actually productively earning during their late teens and in their 20s and then got good at saving. They've set themselves up now. You know, I'll turn 40 this year. That age group, they're all done and dusted. The people who spent their 20s flicking from like casual job to casual job and and not really trying to do something uh, are now seeing that they've got a lot of catching up to do. So I think I don't want to put pressure on people to say you must you know, be earning lots of money in your 20s. It's not that. Just don't flippantly write it off as this lost decade mm. because you are going to be competing against those people who didn't treat it that way and it will be harder later. So I would I would say don't have this whole, you know, go have a year off, go have your discovery year, go take many breaks, switch from course to course, that's fine, whatever it takes for you to find something, but don't just think you've got a decade to spare because you really don't, I don't think. I think it's that's, that again, a bit wasteful of your opportunity mm. uh, where you could be doing so much with that decade that just sets you up for your financial future. I guess at least if you start earlier, you can start making those mistakes earlier and then by the time you're 30, you, you actually know what, what you're doing and you've got your good <laughs> habits ingrained and instead of starting to make mistakes at 30 or 40. And- exactly, when the stakes are huge, right? You don't yeah. want your first property purchase to be the forever family home or like a million-dollar investment property. You want your first investments to be tiny so when you make those mistakes you can recover from them exactly right you know mm-hmm. i like the pro- the properties that you would think of buying like when i bought my first one at 19 i wouldn't have looked at it in my mid-30s there's no way i would have <laughs> yes. wanted to stay in my tiny little ugly 50 square meter you know apartment but man i'm so glad i bought that back then so yeah i think it's um it's really important that people don't just go oh i don't have to worry about it but because they it's yeah, okay, you don't have to worry about it. But if you do something productive with your time, you've just got that much better chance of getting ahead. And I guess it comes back to that concept you mentioned of compounding. It's like you start the compounding of your knowledge and your habits and your, and the money is not even the most important thing in, in that 20s. But if anything that you do start, then I guess by the time you get to 30, 40, this knowledge, this you know, skills, habits, everything's compounded to such an extent and a decade's a big amount of time to make a huge difference at, at the other end if you start earlier, doesn't it? Exactly. I absolutely agree. That compounding does take effect. And you're right, that point you made about it, it's not necessarily about the money. It's about finding something that you can do as a career that brings you immense satisfaction that you can stick with and it can be multiple things and you can change and then learning how to make money out of that. But I really worry about people who don't understand how to make an income because they're going to end up reliant on other people. And I guess I'm seeing that in my age group, the people who are, there's a whole heap of us turning 40 this year and some of us still live like we've just gotten out of school. <laughs> so I, 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 that seems sad to me. You know, that's a missed opportunity. So hopefully people have some fun, but take it seriously too. Well, thanks for being on the podcast today, Lacey. 
Uh, we've got so much to talk about. We're going to have to do this in a two-parter. And next time, I know we're going to cover off some really great topics. We've got uh, how to prevent uh, the bigger things going wrong with our kids as they do start to, to get older. And we also look at that legacy piece of how do we go about leaving wealth or our ideas around um, how to effectively pass it on and, and how much we do decide to leave them or not leave them. So that's a really big question that I'm looking forward to getting into. See you on the next one.